Hello and welcome to Statistically Insignificant, a podcast with bonus special visual effects about statistics. My name is Tess, my pronouns are she, they, and I am your local number herder. My apprentice, who is more focused on the poetry of the landscape we live in than getting these damn numbers into line, is Bart. Hi, Bart. Hey, how's it going? Um, I go by he and him, and this is very much my experience of when I worked in shearing sheds when I was 19. <laughs> of course, you were stand staring out into the beauty of the Australian landscape. <laughs> Today, we have a guest. Asha Wolf is a freelance journalist, disability support worker, sole parent, and was the lead co-organizer in the campaign against RoboDebt. How's it going, Asha? Yeah, pretty good. Um, my pronouns are they, them, and thanks for having me on today. Welcome to the party. So today's topic is an aspect of the Australian welfare state. It's specifically, it is about a points system where people receiving welfare payments have to complete activities in order to earn those payments. This was introduced as part of the recent change to the Workforce Australia system. There are two parts to this episode, what the points-based system is as a bureaucratic tool, and some statistical advice for how someone subjected to this system can minimise its impact on their lives. So Asha, to get started, can you tell Tell us what this points-based system is. Basically, it's the gamification um, of a nudge system. Um, it's automated to some degree. So first of all, it, it pushes people who have previously seen job support agents, um, job service agents, towards um, doing everything online um, without JSPs. The second thing that it pushes towards is a point system. Um, so it, it says, you know, we are expanding uh, to have a wider range of things that you can do to meet your mutual obligations. Um, the problem with that, of course, is that it's beginning to look a lot more like Parents Next, which is something that has caused a lot of harm to people. Okay. So uh, two questions come out of that. What are mutual obligations within the welfare system and what was going on with Parents Next? Right. So previously you had to apply for how many um, jobs per month? Um, and then based on that, you were given your payment. Um, so they're kind of tasks that you have to do in order to get a payment. Right, exactly. Um, which is interesting in itself because um, getting social security is supposed to be a right. It's not something that when you look at the legislation says, and you must, you know, meet these mutual obligations and then get it. It's like, no, you know, you're, you're qualified to get it and you get it. <laughs> so now what we're seeing with, this new program with Workforce Australia Online is a system that's a lot more like Parents Next, which Parents Next essentially said, hey, we don't think you know what you're doing as parents, so we're going to ask <laughs> you to... <laughs> I know, it sounds crap. It is crap. That's why it's crap. So it had people go out and essentially have to um, go to the library with their kids or take their kids swimming or um, all the things that you do anyway with young kids but it made it into an obligation rather than a, a thing that you do when you've got time. And anybody who's got young children, I've got a young child. I'm not that young anymore, but I do remember um, those days where you're kind of like, oh, I've got to rush to the supermarket. I've got to get that load of laundry on. And, hmm, and there's no time. Right. And so, like, of course, you'd go off to the library when you could or if there was an opportunity to attend um, something that's educational with your kid, of course, you'd go and do it. But you need flexibility when you're working with when you're living with young children and um, parents next doesn't provide that and as well as that it's patriarchal the assumption that um, hey you don't know how to parent therefore we're going to ask you to do all of these things um, and otherwise we're going to dock your welfare payment. Well, it's quite it's coercive outrageous. yeah and also like did they actually provide material support for people to go and do that? No, what was worse was they put the onus on the community. So librarians were like, why is this person asking me to sign off a form for like... Ah, classic, yeah, yeah. And they're, and they're really angry. They're like, this isn't appropriate at all. It makes it into a space that isn't safe for people. Yeah, um, for sure. Nobody wants to be forced to go to the library if they don't want to go, and nor should they. Yeah. So looking at um, Workforce Australia Online, it's kind of like that, but... Once again, with the patriarchal kind of um, paternalist overview, oversight over people, um, but then also a much wider range of um, tasks that you can undertake. Now, if you've ever um, met people who are, you know, 
um, trying to struggle through the system, a lot of them have disabilities. Um, around 40% at least have some form of disability on JobSeeker, who would probably be better off on DSP, but can't meet the framework of points to be classified as disabled, according to the government. Oh boy, we have another episode in the works about like quantifying disability, specifically in the context of the welfare state, because it is really fucked up. So fucked up. Yeah. Incredibly fucked up, because why should somebody who's not a doctor quantify if you are disabled or not? Why should somebody decide whether or not you get payments based on, you know, what a, a job service um, agency says? You know, like these sort of things are just fucked. So now with Workforce Australia Online and the task-based points that they want you to meet each week, which are supposed to float around 100 points a week, maybe a bit less if they, if they agree to drop the points, but um, that has to be negotiated for each person individually, which I'm guessing will be an adversarial system. The standard that I have heard about is 100 points per month or per period, which is usually four weeks because you get paid in like two-week blocks basically, right? Right. Okay. So... I should let you know um, my experience with the system. I was on a payment years and years and years ago, but um, in recent years I've been on uh, family tax benefit, um, so I haven't been on job seeker payments. So I'm speaking from a perspective of somebody who's dealt with a robo debt, whose mum has dealt with a robo debt. And, oh jeez. <laughs> yeah, and is quite aware of like how adversarial these systems are. My interest in these systems is how the automation makes things so much more unfair, unequal. It's really quite problematic. And so when you begin to look at the tasks that they've, you know, said, oh, yes, of course, you 100 points um, per, what was it, two weeks or four weeks? Oh, four weeks. So, it's yeah, yeah, so it's per month, basically. Um, you've put four months on the slide there. Oh, four, thank you. It should be four weeks. My brain. Well, it does kind of rot your brain looking at this. Like, they've got Defence Force Reserves, 15 points, with flexibility to increase. Like, this is coercion to join the army, essentially. <laughs> so there is some ability to change this requirement can be reduced, like, based on personal circumstance, right? In theory. Yeah. But, again, how that will actually work, we don't know. We get to, to come across anybody who's successfully dropped their points from 100. Oh, really? That's interesting. So, There's um, no incentive for a, for a job agent to actually drop your hours. Okay, so this is a decision made by the job agents. Or the there's like a, a digital panel, they call it, or something okay. like that. <laughs> <laughs> you can contact and they can decide. But I haven't heard of anybody who's figured out how to do it yet. Um, okay. So they've outsourced the, um, the decisions on the points to the private uh, companies um, doing like job... The job um, service providers. So service my understanding providers. is that the points per activity are set by the government, but your job service provider, if you are with a job service provider now and not just in the just online thing, they can adjust your points requirements. So they could lower it if they say, okay, you have this other stuff going on, which meant that you couldn't meet your target this month or something like that, which requires a great deal more empathy and compassion than job service provider workers are encouraged to have. Let's say. I think that's the most diplomatic way of putting it. And that's, and look, it's it's really concerning that we're leaving this in the hands of people who aren't trained as social workers, who aren't trained as, um, in any way, medical professionals to make decisions about people's lives. Yeah, so that is a, an interesting feature of the job service provider system, which um, seems to have been greatly reduced as a result of this transition to Workforce Australia, but has, for one, not been completely eliminated. And for two, they are still being given power over people's well-being and power over people's, like, payments in a really scary way. Okay, so the job service provider workers aren't trained in the way that a social worker would be or a disability support person would be? Right, so one of the Salvation Army's recent, um, recent adverts for um, a person to work on as a, as a JSP was essentially like no experience needed. Like you're working with vulnerable people. Yeah. With people who are at the worst moment, who are unemployed. No experience needed? Really? Like, I don't know. Like if I had a family member who was in crisis, who was looking for work, who was being sent off to do all of these tasks, would I really want somebody with no experience necessary jumping into their life? So this reflects somewhat of a, of a different issue and a broader issue like within the welfare system. And this is something we talked a bit 
with the Australia Unemployed Workers um, Union. So we talked about the app that they have where people can go and rate their job service providers and disability employment service providers, which is still up, by the way. So if you are subjected to this, you can go and complain about it. And one of the things that we, we talked a bit about is like the people who are employed in this system will frequently either burn out or like basically just kind of grit their teeth and struggle through because they can see that the harm that's being done. And it's not uncommon for people when they do burn out and leave these workplaces to go to the unemployed workers union and say, hey, here is the laundry list of shit that I saw, which is abusive towards people, which we were not trained in any way to recognize and to prevent, or even that we were told to do by our bosses, which was either like abusive or illegal or whatever else. So Oh, there's a lot of stuff going on within this JSP system, which is subjecting these vulnerable people to really quite uh, abusive environments with untrained like workers and with management that is profiteering as much as possible from the system. And in the case of the Salvation Army, it's part of their 150 years campaign of waging war against the working class. Yeah. They used to send their bands to um, strikes before when like union organizers were giving speeches. Um, so to, to drown them out. The yeah. Bastards. Yeah. The thing with these points, when you look at them, when you look at how many points are assigned to them, some of them, like for instance, counseling or drug and alcohol rehabilitation interventions, well, you begin to get into to areas of, um, you know, who says that chatting with, your next door neighbour is in counselling or yeah. what constitutes um, drug and alcohol interventions? Is it your family sitting around the living room? Um, and who's going to, you know, tick off that that's okay? You know, do they need a cert for in, in AOD um, to to have it be considered a, an alcohol and drug rehabilitation um, centre or, you know, things like non-vocational assistance. So, for instance, cultural services or personal development courses – Okay, so if I go off and do a course for half an afternoon where I uh, uh, learn how to put on makeup, <laughs> um, not that I would probably, but uh, would that be considered a non-vocational assistance for 15 points? Like, we really don't know and we're really testing out the system at the moment to find out, you know. Some of the major problems that the AOU has pointed out with this, and I think the uh, minister, while he has seemed wedded and in fact voted for this system to come into place, has uh, flagged that a review should happen as well, is that there is so little detail in what counts for the different activities. Like the government website is quite unhelpful and there's a lot of like, there's this automation interface between you, the person doing the activities and the system that gives you your money so you can live. And that presents a real barrier to people thinking, well, am I going to spend my time on this thing which may or may not get me these points of this activity, even if it is genuinely valuable for me to do and important for me to do, but I have to optimise, I have to choose what my time is spent on or I might not eat or pay rent. So and this I think that's really important because what you end up with is we're putting the onus on people to find these activities and particularly in rural, rural areas. Like, I'm quite literate, I'm able to... I've got a car so I can travel. Um, but I found it quite hard to find places to volunteer when I was first in, first here and really new to the area. Yeah. Because a lot of things are word of mouth. Yeah. Also, people in poverty, um, you know, <sighs> depression is pretty common and we're putting a huge um, onus on them to um, – to meet these tasks and these points and not really giving them very much guidance at all about what will be acceptable according to the government. Um, a lot of people are going to fail in, in getting the points that they need. And and that's how the system is set up. It's not set up to help people meet their obligations. It's, it's set up to exit people off the welfare system. Mm. And I feel like the automation is a really big part of that. So I am, if you will, professionally skeptical about automated systems by being a statistician. And I, you are professionally skeptical about them as a result of your own work. So what they often serve to do is, for one, they claim to cut costs as a result of re removing the wage aspect of providing services. 
but they also serve as a, a system of alienation because you no longer have a person that you can explain something to. It's a computer screen or a website or something like that. But they also like provide an easy out for a government to deny services and support. I mean, I can't remember what TV show it is. I think it's the IT crowd or something. But the meme of computer says no is so right. prevalent in these. Huge, huge in robo debt. Like computer says no. Like why does it say no? Oh, don't know. How, how do I find out why I've got a robo debt? Oh, you have to FOI your own file from the government. Like what? <laughs> yeah. Oh, my me. God. Um, <laughs> And so, and there was hundreds of thousands of people, um, you know, trying to FOI their own files so that they could take it to the AAT. Sorry, what's the AAT? The administrative, um, AAT stands for. Oh man. Oh, sorry. <laughs> administrative Appeals Tribunal. So basically, the Administrative Appeals Tribunal um, was where people who had challenged robo debts with Services Australia but failed with Services Australia went next. So they go to the Administrative Appeals Tribunal. Um, the government stacked the AAT with their mates. As, right, yes, <laughs> of course. Um, <laughs> which made it very, very hard. Um, I think it was Carney was one of the uh, the guys who was one of the judges with the AAT and he basically quit and said it was a sham. You know, and it's these sort of processes where everything – leads to a point where you can never win like the house always wins because yeah. that's how the machine is set up and that's what we see a lot with um, services australia you can't make the points you can't figure out how to challenge the number of points that you've got to get you can't figure out how to um you know get onto the dsp or even if you can you can't meet the points because of the way that the tables the assessment tables have been set up so, so that is the um, points the points for your disability rating as opposed to the points for this uh points-based workforce right. system yeah and there's a lot really, of point systems I mean, running around and they all suck people as real people yeah absolutely you know? um, people are points you know you can't sum people up and go oh you you're worth 100 points and therefore we'll let you live this week and here's the money. Um, this this is outrageous. Like people are meant to have what they need when they need it. They shouldn't have to argue that they're, you know, I've made the five extra points I need to be allowed to buy food this week for yeah. the kids. Well, every example well, you've example. used of how many points you get for things seems insanely low to me as well. Like t a quarter of your obligation to join the army. Like We'll get to that. Don't <laughs> worry. We have I have a whole section later on about the points and the, the problems with that as a measurement system. But in the meantime, like, so the way the system works is you, each person has some number of points that they need to achieve in order to get paid. So what happens if I fail to meet the points target? You don't, well, you get a warning first. Okay. And you're allowed to sign something that essentially says I will meet the points and then you go off and you meet the points and then they reinstate it. So it's sort of like a contract again. Right. Uh, I'm not sure if you can do it once or twice, but at some point they essentially say, too bad, boop, boop, and they right. go off for that one. Um, and you, to come back onto the system, you have to sign something again that says that you will meet your points in future. Okay, so you basically have one quote-unquote warning uh, oh. I think it's actually more than one. I have to look it up. I think it's okay. two, but I'm pretty sure. Hang on. The points-based activation system in, yes, but I want it in English. So it's good. They've got it in a few different languages. Um, I do not want to want to listen to this video that they've got here now. So they've got a lot more information than they did a month ago. Yeah, so funny, isn't it? But they actually <laughs> still started it without all that information. So... Um, if you don't meet your points target, tell your provider or your digital services contact centre straight away. They will assess whether you have a valid reason for not meeting it. Well, what's valid? Yeah, right. Like, we've heard of people with cancer being knocked off. Far out. Seeker. We've heard of people, yes. you know, um, whose parents have died and they've been told, no, I'm sorry, you still have to meet your, your obligations. Um, if you don't have enough points banked and you don't meet your points target, your payment could go on hold and you could get a demerit. What's a demerit? Okay. Ooh, this is interesting. <laughs> okay. Targeted compliance framework. Um, we use compliance symbols. It's easy to check. Let's have a look. Tick, a green tick in a circle. You're in the green zone. You're in the green zone and meeting your obligations. An orange circle with an exclamation point. You're in a warning zone. If you're in a warning zone, oh you have God. one or more demerits for not meeting your obligations. You can have five demerits in the warning zone. 
Each demerit expires after six months. Six months? Six That's months? That shit. Oh, my God. <laughs> You screwed. Like you got really fucked up. Yeah. Um. You know, you don't hold this sort of stuff against people for years and years, and that's what they're doing essentially. There's no way of like winding it down, particularly if you've got complex issues or problems or. Yeah, I mean, those things don't go away, and they get worse. I imagine many of them with things like stress that you're going to get kicked out because you don't get your payments. Oh, here's a nice one. If you can see a clock symbol, you're in resolution time. What the fuck's resolution time? You didn't meet an obligation on time and you have two business days to meet your obligation. Oh, my if God. If you don't, your payment will oh. go on hold. A red triangle with an exclamation point means re-engagement. Your income support payment is on hold. You need to meet a re-engagement requirement to get it back. Your re-engagement requirement is in your tasks. So you have to go into your tasks and find out what your re-engagement task is jesus christ so this is basically great and it is far easier to hand in my assignments to do this shit Uh, a red circle with a cross in it you're in the penalty zone oh my god (laughs) (laughs) bad dog bad bad dog like right like (laughs) yeah yeah yeah. (laughs) if you don't meet your obligations your income support will be reduced what wait no they're not just cancelling people's payments. They're reducing their payments. After three times in the penalty zone, your payment will be cancelled for four weeks. Oh, my God. So they oh my God. Do nothing for four weeks, for a month. Oh. What do they expect people to live on? Nothing. They expect them to starve. That's the, that's okay. the only reasonable answer to this, is that you are expected to starve. Oh, here we go. Fast track failures. <laughs> if you fail to attend <laughs> a scheduled job interview or you intentionally act in a manner at a job interview which could result in an offer of unemployment not being made to you or you fail to complete a job referral ah, so that's interesting if you have fewer than three demerits when you commit a fail commit this is language of crime oh yeah um somebody with a criminology background like we're talking about people committing a failure without a valid reason like <laughs> Well, so this is interesting because it says, well, the, the language there of if if you don't show up to the job applica- to the job interview and to the ju- presumably the judgment of the employer, take it seriously and like grovel enough to get a job, then they can go back to Centrelink and say, hey, this person, if, what was it, fast track failure or something? I can't remember the term. Yeah, they call it fast track failure. Yeah. So what this is doing is it. it, it I mean, this is something that like labor unions should be very aware of is that this is basically giving employers the power to punish unemployed people for not accepting working conditions and punish them quite immediately while they are not in the workplace. So this is a huge overreach of employer power, but it also means that if you have somebody who, for whatever reason, does not present in a way that is considered like professional enough, and I'm making like big scary air quotes with this, maybe they are trans, maybe they just don't have a home environment which allows them to do the kind of personal grooming that you might want, to, that they might want to do, or whatever else. These people are going to be punished by this system and they are encouraged to be punished by employers for not meeting employers' standards for what counts as taking it seriously. Centrelink says, sorry, Services Australia, or like they're still using the word Centrelink <laughs> um, here on the website. <laughs> if you have three or four demerits when you commit a failure without valid reason, your re engagement requirement will be a capability assessment, capability assessment with Centrelink. So I'm assuming that you can be bounced out of where it forced Australia online into the specialist track, mm. which will mean that you have a lot of, a lot more surveillance upon you. Um, They've also got what they call serious failures, which is if you don't accept a suitable job offer, if you accept a suitable job offer but you don't actually start the job, if you leave a suitable job voluntarily or if you're dismissed from a job because of misconduct. So if you quit your job, it's considered a serious failure. Yeah, and, like, God help you if, for example, your boss is sexually harassing you. Right, and they say if your payment is cancelled, you must serve a full serve, again, with the language of criminalisation. Um, and you serve a four-week period, and you'll also need to reapply for your income support payment. So you're completely cut off. It's not suspended. It's completely cut off. Yeah. If you disagree with your decision, um, contact your provider. Contact the National Customer Service Line. <laughs> oh, my God. 
Yeah, so you, all this time you were expected to do this horrible administrative process after being cut off from your welfare payments while you were starving, while you were trying to wrangle that you probably can't pay rent anymore or whatever else. So it's just it's just a machine grinding misery out of these people. Fucking hell. Well, also, I think about like, um, so my job, uh, my day job is I'm a postie. And um, one of the things about that is for the first three to six months when you're not very good at it, um, it's really difficult and stressful. Um, once you kind of get into the groove, it's okay. But a lot of people quit in that yeah. first three to six months and they would be punished be because it is an insanely like stressful process for the first like three to six months until you are like skilled for the job. I, mean, I think that's pretty, that's not uncommon. Like, and, and this is basically just saying that employers have more power than they should for one, but also employers get rewarded and get given more power for being spiteful assholes to their employees and potential employees. Yeah. Look, the other thing that they get pushed towards um, doing as JSPs is nudging people towards the sort of jobs that are um, what the government wants to take people to take. So if you look at the Workforce Australia website right now, they're pushing grape harvesting in Hunter Valley and yeah. mango picking in Darwin at the moment. And, you know, right up front is, you know, go off and, you know, wander the uh, the fruit picking trail. Um, it's it's really sort of grapes of wrath. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, people can't survive this sort of stuff long term. Yeah, and also, like, to say to somebody, and we'll get to this more when we get to, like, talking, looking at the specific examples, but say to somebody, hey, there's work up in the Hunter Valley. You should go and do it. Presumes that they are able to go and do that. They are physically able to do fruit picking, which is a very physically demanding job. I mean, I wouldn't be able to do it, for example, because I have like a lower back injury and arthritis and all of these things that would make it like it would just destroy me. So that also like if they don't have a car, if they don't have somewhere to stay in the area, they are so there's, there's a huge barrier to going and doing that job, even if the job technically exists. And I suspect that the government doesn't really understand that, given the number of stories I've heard of people being offered through job service providers jobs in another state, or being told to go to like other cities or whatever in order to go to a job service provider in the first place. And if you live in a city, um, it's and you are on welfare, it seems unlikely that you would have a car because it's an insanely expensive thing and usually you can get around on public transport and that kind of thing. Yeah, and also, like, there, there is a very real, like, geographical inequality here. So people who live in cities are probably going to have easier access to jobs that they can apply for or get interviews for or whatever, easier ways of getting to those jobs. And, like, job service providers may be more readily available than if you're in regional or rural areas. So this system, in its effort to standardise, which is one of the things it claims to do, is baking in all of this kind of inequality that we already know exists in like both geographical and social. Like if you have different skill sets, there will be like more or fewer jobs that you can apply for in different areas. So in this effort to standardize, they are baking in this inequality and basically making it something that you can't get adjustments for. So previously, Although the job service provider system is fucked up and abuses people and everything, if you had a job service provider writing a job plan for you, theoretically, they could account more easily for the different circumstances you're in. Instead of just lowering this points limit, they could say, okay, we know there's not a hell of a lot of jobs in this area, here's this other thing that you can do instead. Whereas now, a job application is a job application is a job application is worth five points, whether you are in Sydney or Perth or somewhere out in the middle of like nowhere where there's nothing around you. And that is a real failure of this standardized system to account for the messy reality of how people live. Yeah, and look, I would go so far as to say it's racist. Oh yeah, um, 100%. <laughs> I mean, even aside from the like particular geographical um distribution of, for example, remote com indigenous communities that have enough like other problems and like with poverty and everything and lack of governmental support who are still subjected to all of this, even in like cities like Sydney or wherever, if you don't have English as your native language, if you are, for example, a refugee who has come here with nothing and has wound up 
in this system after getting permanent residency somehow, then you face all of the racism that gets directed at people who come in without English as a, as a as like a native language. You may get racism because of your skin color or your culture or whatever else on top of that as well. There is a real failure to account for that structure. The response from Workforce Australia Online um, to this is to say, hey, but we've decided to have specialist providers <laughs> to provide personalized services to specific cohorts um, such as cultural and linguistically diverse communities to Indigenous Australians, ex-offenders mm. and refugees. Okay, so are they going to be are they going to be the people who don't require any training too to be in job service provider jobs, or are we actually introducing some training? It doesn't seem that this. Oh my god! Any at this point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. So, <laughs> it's really worrying. So APM has quite a lot of the contracts. APM. Um, yeah. So. Oh, is this a yeah. particular company that does the job service provider stuff? Yes. Okay. So, just having a quick look at APM's current contracts. I think they got 44 contracts out of um, Workforce Australia Online. Let's take a look. That sounds like a lot of money uh, to me. Yeah, 44 contracts, which works out at, so 27 employment regions, uh, $9 billion of funding. Oh, fucking hell. Uh, till <laughs> 20th of June 28. Uh, also, the transition to work market has estimated funding of $1.5 billion over five years. Also, it's interesting to note that um, Connect is, so with a K, K O N E K T, is doing DSP assessments and they're also running disability employment services under APM as well. Ah. So, this is one so of the things. Deciding whether you meet the points or not, yeah. the same people that are making money by cutting you off the system through Workforce Australia Online. Ah, that's not corrupt in the slightest. <laughs> so one of the things I actually did want to talk about is who this system, well, who is subjected to this system. So most of the way that people think about this is, oh, it's unemployed people who are on Job Seeker. I think it's called Job Seeker now. It used to be called, um, what is it, New Start. And then before that, it was just the dole or unemployment benefits or whatever. But that's not the only group who are. So you've mentioned disability employ uh, employment services as well. So how does that work? So if you're on, let's have a look here. I think that DSP, that people on DSP aren't um, subject to this in particular. Okay. The, the reason I ask is that I know somebody who is on the disability support pension who has been with a disability employment services provider for a long time uh, and has been regularly abused by them. So uh, this friend of mine has not only been repeatedly misgendered in a really like malicious fashion, even after the, correcting the worker, but also like had various jobs pushed at them that they felt a lot of pressure to accept that were in direct contravention of their disability. And that seems to be quite a common story among people who are like with these disability employment service providers and also like have this, they have been assessed as being able to work some amount. So they are forced into this kind of a system. Right. And, and really these sort of systems are, again, nudge systems that are pushing, they're automated to some degree. So the government sends messages to this JSP to DES that essentially says, hey, push your people to try and get jobs so that we can get them off the system. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't really matter that you have disability or illness or injury. Um, yeah, they don't care. <laughs> um, yeah, for sure. So they just want to keep you, first of all, on the job seeker payment, not moving up into DSP. Um, and if they can, boot you off the job seeker payment completely. Um, the, the real aim is to keep people from accessing um, welfare at all DSP. yeah well so are parents also subjected to this or is parents next its own kind of thing so parents next is its funny own kind of thing still let's have a look so i'm not sure if parents next got knocked out when let's have a look so it's only for people whose children are under six who get a parenting payment okay um so you can volunteer to take part in Parents Next, um, which but, I strongly advise you, you do not. Yeah, right. Um, so it, it, Parents Next is a points-based system, but it's not the same as this one. 
No, it's not. It's its own thing. It's supposed to set help you set study and work goals and participation plans and meet with you regularly and help you get access to services. It was never meant to be this sort of level of um, pushiness, mm. um, eligibility rules. So you may need to take part in Parents Next Oh, um, if you have a child aged nine months to six years and you're under 55 and you've been getting parenting payment but you haven't worked in six months. Uh, one of the following must also apply. If you're under 22 and you haven't completed year 12, uh, you're 22 or over but you haven't completed year 12 and you've been getting income support for two years, you're 22 or over and you've been getting income support for more than four years. So essentially it's saying, hey, if you have kids and you're not working for an extended period of time. Fuck um, you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're going to dump you into the program. Um, you don't need to take part in Parents Next if you're under 15 years of age. Oh, Jesus if Christ, that's horrific. Earnings <laughs> hours, employment to us. So one way to subvert the whole, you know, Parents Next thing is if you can find anything that pays you anything at all, even five hours worth of work yeah. in every six months, you don't have to go on Parents, Parents Next. Next if you've declared any earnings or hours of employment in the last six months. Okay, but I can Im- also, like- but like I, so I'm not a parent. But everything I have seen of parenting says that it is a relentless fuckload of work. So this is saying that for one thing, so it was six months to six years, right? So that's proposing that after six years, somehow parenting stops being work. But also, <laughs> but, right? <laughs> but, but also that in that time, a parent's work is not going to be taken up by doing parenting which if you have like a couple of kids under six or even one kid under six maybe they have like they need just more attention and more of your time that's just impossible particularly like i imagine for single parents it's even worse and the majority of people who did end up on parents next were single parents oh my god because you, you can't really choose between uh particularly when your children are young you can't choose between uh am I going to care for my child or work? It's just yeah. the child always comes first mm. and whatever you can get done around it, you get done. Mm. But that really depends on your capacity and your support structures that you've got in place often from other people. Um, yeah. Cause like childcare. So I, I can't remember the estimate of how much childcare are cost in Australia for like under six. Right. But you have to be earning enough that the childcare payment itself does not wipe out your earnings in order to make it worth doing and that's well, quite a high threshold so i waited till my child was 12 to go back to uni because i could not afford yeah. the childcare when he was little to continue mm. with any of the sort of things that i wanted to do um and even if i could i found that i couldn't get the hours that i needed yeah but the child care would start yeah. at like 7 30 and my class would start at eight and it took like an hour to get across from the child care to like the next suburb in peak hour traffic yeah you know it was just obvious that i was going to flunk out and that i couldn't afford it and on top of that you have to deal with the child su- child care subsidy um issues so <laughs> you have to prove that you're you're studying enough hours to meet your obliga- mm, obligation no. yeah, again with the points um yeah look the point systems in general are really problematic and mm. the more that governments try to um reduce people to the lowest common denominator of uh you know you can quantify a human's worth or value into a point um they will fail to understand people's needs and it will harm people Mm. Um, and really that's what the worry is with Workforce Australia Online right now is that people are being harmed, that the government doesn't care and that it really needs to stop um, all of this sort of stuff about demerits and penalties. Um, if people fail to do things that are meant to be helping them with their life, they shouldn't be facing penalties. Yes. They shouldn't be facing penalising language. Um, yeah. I think the other thing that I, I, I really find... Um, dismal about this system is that it's creating a class of people who are actually quite often working um but working insecure work working part-time work that doesn't pay enough to support them um you know pay the rent pay the bills um but they need to to supplement it with job seeker payments and then they get caught in cycles of 
you know, not being able to meet the obligations of job seeker payments, worrying, you know, about getting cut off or having to run to appointments when they were working or should be working mm. or can't get to work because, you know. Yeah, and I've heard horror stories of people being, like, penalised for not meeting, like, job service providers. Like, they have appointments there, but they call them up and go, hey, I'm working, I can't come to this, and the job service provider penalises them. And it's really hard to fight that penalty as well. With this sort of stuff, if they ever offer you to, like, and I noticed that they suggest you can volunteer to do Parents Next, you know, if you're ever offered the opportunity to volunteer yourself for points-based systems, say no. Yes. <laughs> say no. <laughs> yeah. Like, don't, never, ever, it's not there to help you. It's only going to harm you in your life. How do they, how do they try and sell it to you to volunteer? Um, they suggest that you can choose to take part if you're, um, you've got study or work goals or if you have a child younger than six years of age. Um, it's interesting. I think part of the reason that Parents Next, um, Parents Next quite often captures um, Indigenous parents. Mm -hmm. So it was originally targeted specifically at um, people who were young parents yeah. um, and Indigenous. Um, Well, in general, these automated systems, wherever they exist, are not there to help the person subjected to them. Like, even if it's not in a welfare state, like, if it's in your work or whatever else, systems that evaluate you based on points like this, that are kind of gamified way of looking at activities, are basically never structured in a way that is intended to optimize your experience. It's intended to optimize the experience of whoever's producing the system and running it. Right. And so, like, if you look at things like Parents Next, they have an intensive stream that operates in 30 locations um, and that it's specifically targeted at people who um, who are Indigenous parents. And that was one of the documents they deleted off since then. Oh. Oh. Because, you know, that's what you do. Um, <laughs> but it is a racist program. Yeah. Um, and it was always meant to, to target certain certain people, certain demographics of people. I, I think the interesting thing is how these systems stream um, different parts of the population. So yeah. um, suddenly you've got an intensive stream for, for Parents Next or you've got a, a specialist stream within Workforce Australia Online and you really want to try and avoid ending up being labelled as a participant in one of those streams because really what you end up with is high level of surveillance upon your, your activities in life. Um, never voluntarily give up information to uh workforce australia online or parents next or any you know services australia um they're not there to help you just keep that always in the back of your mind yes yeah, so i found it really interesting when i was looking at this system coming into place because i did some consulting work for um AU, looking at what people expected to see as they moved into the system and what the system was looking like and the fact that it was framed as oh well if you're having a bit of of trouble we offer you this like not online system this continuation of the job service provider stuff as an option which could give you more support maybe you don't like the online system for whatever reason because you find it alienating which is very justified because you don't have a reliable internet connection not your fault all these sorts of things or maybe you're an older person who doesn't like understand or not even understand, but doesn't have a great level of digital literacy. So a, a points-based online activation system is just kind of a wall to you, which was one of the things that actually came up in the trials done on this points-based system. All of these groups get kind of offered, quote-unquote, this older system in order to patch over the fact that online systems only are fucked. And this system, as you say, not only... Uh, institutes a greater level of surveillance because it's going back to the job um, service providers, but also puts people in this environment where they are more likely to have like under-trained support workers because job service provider workers are not given the right training, managers over those people who are pushing them to do things that generate profit instead of actually helping people. So one of the big scandals that's come out at the moment is a whole bunch of these job service provider companies also run training programs. And there was originally a like clause in legislation which said hey if you are a job service provider who runs education or training programs or whatever you can't 
coerce, encourage, uh, whatever you, however you want to frame it, force people who are your clients into those programs in order to fulfill their obligations. Because of lobbying by job service provider companies, that clause was removed. So now they are free to churn that money handle as fast and as hard as they can. And of course, your workers will be like pushed by their managers to do that because it generates money for the company. So you have all of these kind of um, like structures around this system which make that in-person stuff alienating and punishing in its own way and mean that like the groups who are automatically put into that like specialist stream or additional support stream because they are assessed by Centrelink to be less likely to find a job, they get shat on, they get surveilled, they get abused more by that system. And anybody who looks at this online system and goes, well, this is fucked up. I can't handle this. It's not built in a manner that works for me. Maybe I'll try this in-person stuff. They are then stepping into that really quite dangerous environment for them. Right, exactly. Um, and you're more likely to be subjected to extra um, trainings, <laughs> which really just means that they'll, they'll send you off to do a bunch of tiny little courses and expect you to be able to, to manage these systems or handle, you know, being online, which, you know, is really difficult, particularly for older people quite often, or, or people who are um, English, whose English is as a second language. Um, and that's echoed by Vinnie's Australia. I think it was only a few days ago. They said, you know, they're witnessing a growing confusion and fear among job seekers, many of whom have been forced to struggle with the inadequacies of the new online platform. Yeah. Um, and that they're deeply concerned mm. about the welfare of vulnerable job seekers using Workforce Australia Online um, because there isn't adequate information on how to navigate the new and complex job services program. So one of the big things that came out of the survey that I worked on for AUU was that the communication done prior to the start of the Workforce Australia implementation was dog shit. Like nearly half of the people who responded to the survey had not had any contact to say whether they would be just online or they would continue to see a job service provider automatically. And even beyond that, like nobody knew what the system was going to look like. This includes people who were going to be subjected to it because frankly the government documents then were abysmal, the government documents now are mildly better, but even people working within the system. So I heard from a number of people I know who work for Centrelink or work for job service providers or disability support people, mostly they've left those jobs because they were really bad, but they're just saying like nobody in this system knows what it's going to look like, we haven't been trained, we haven't been shown anything, there is no communication, there is no information, it's going to be a bloody shambles. Lo and behold, it's a bloody shamble. <laughs> Nobody is surprised by this. And like that, the government is choosing to push ahead and keep it implemented while they do the quote unquote review or inquiry, whatever that's going to be, just means that the misery machine is grinding on in the meantime. And who knows what it's going to look like in the end if it gets cancelled or not. I'm going to guess it won't because the Labour government voted for this. Right. No, I don't see Labour really um, slowing down on any of this at all. They're very ideologically bonded to the idea of mutual obligations, which is kind of at the heart of all of this and kind of the core problem that leads to the construction of these automated systems that you think people who are on these welfare benefits have to prove that they deserve them every month. If you don't do that, then all of this goes away. Shorten's come out and said, you know, if anything, he wants to, to cross-link these systems even more oh so that God. you can use something like... Um, Workforce Australia Online to also nudge people to get their cancer checks on time. Oh, f <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting because if you click on um, the businesses section of Workforce Australia Online, there's a real push to, um, you know, get businesses to create profiles. Um, so, and I was thinking, oh, maybe I could, could register AWU. Um, <laughs> God, that would be funny. Australia online, uh, but what's interesting is when you you look at it, um, you have to have a digital identity and a relationship authorization manager. Um, so immediately it becomes this um, big surveillance thing. Yeah, yeah. So it's not like your local fish and chip shop that might hire a teenager to keep them afloat while they finish off uni. That's going to um, have an identity on. Um, Workforce Australia Online, what we're really doing is creating monopolies of, of workforce labour yeah. through these um, platforms. 
Um, so, you know, you have to create a digital identity. You have to have a standard identity strength. You have to have a MyGov ID. You have to have um, an ABN linked to the digital identity. Uh, <laughs> so this is, in many respects, like restricting the kinds of, well, not just the kinds of employers that you can work for, but also like tailoring that sort of system to big employers who have more resources and are better able to, um, shall we say, control their workforces. So like I'm looking at this in the context of work for the doll, which is already an extremely fucked up system that they have to keep saying, no, no, this isn't actually slavery, despite the fact that the, the actual like pay is close to zero per hour, realistically. And all the conditions are often extremely dangerous. Like people have died on work for the doll sites. And people and like they're consistently worse in terms of health and safety precisely because the kind of employers who will get work for the doll people in not likely to have like great work environments because they're doing work for the doll because it's cheap and you know what else is cheap cutting worker safety so <laughs> at least in the immediate time i mean i'm i'm not quite sure if this is correct or not but i don't think fair work actually has access to work for the doll sites as far as i'm aware uh, yeah, that's something to check. That's something like like I know that the CFMEU is um, more inclined to help the Australian Unemployed Workers Union, but the fact that the ACTU, the Australian Council of Trade Unions, has said, "Oh, the AU is not a union; we don't endorse them," all this sort of thing, just means that this sort of really fundamental stuff that unions should be involved with, which is literally worker safety on the ground, just gets completely missed. And that's that's an institutional failing of the union movement. But this is all just a little bit of history repeating because yeah. the same thing happened in the 1930s. Um, you know, the the union, the Labor Party, as it was, um, they they didn't the Central Committee of Management. They didn't want to know about the unemployment movement yeah. in Australia. They um, mm. Trades Hall still has the uh, the batons um, on display um, that. Un unemployed workers used to um, basically fight the union because they saw them as scabs who wouldn't come and help you know mm. um, people who were unemployed um, the only thing the unemployed have ever won is by force you absolutely know, we, we never won any um, concessions from the union any support from the union um, unless you know there was basically riots in the street yeah I love when Labor Party people call each other comrade. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They'll be comrades um, when they come and do work for the doll with the rest of everybody else. Like, yeah. like if yeah. you have somebody who's working at your site and you're a Labor Party member, and, and I'm aware that there are people who consider themselves good union ALP members. Yeah. Yeah, good union members, and they're using slave labor, essentially. Yep. Um, and I think that's really what we should call, and we should call, um, mutual obligations is slave labor yeah um you know, it's coercive and when things are coercive that's not done freely well i do think that all, all labor under capital is inherently coercive but this is particularly bad because there is like state power behind it even more than normal let's say and also the fact that the payment is so low it's well below the minimum wage i think uh we'll, we'll get to how long like work for the doll takes but if you do like 25 hours which is the quote unquote full-time work for the doll per week and your payment is i think the standard is like 250 dollars a week that's 10 dollars an hour approximately which is like half the minimum wage so this is yeah but that 20 points a week is all that you can get for work for the doll yeah we'll get to that but this is just looking at the like actual um so it's not the complete amount right but if you before workforce australia if you did full-time work for the doll that's what it looked like well below the minimum wage so at the moment, the points-based system is still a part of Workforce Australia. Among other groups, the Australian Unemployed Workers Union are putting pressure on the government ministers and everybody else for mutual obligations to get suspended, in, at least until this inquiry or review is done, or hopefully just entirely cut. Uh, but it's still there. And at time of the recording, the minister has said that actually he's quite dedicated to the existence of these mutual obligations, so they're unlikely to disappear entirely. So while people are subjected to this stupid gamified system, I think it's worth arming them with the tools to minimize its impact on their lives. This means that we have to think about it as a system of measurement and try to optimize to get the points goal as easily as possible for a given person. That's going to look 
individual to each person. Like your circumstances are not the same as my circumstances and not the same as somebody else's. So what I'm going to look at is what's easy to measure, but I'm going to flag where like individual stuff will come into play. I'm working with uh, Daniel Levy of the Australian Unemployed Workers Union on a web page which will help people to do this because not everybody has the kind of training that they can sit down and design this sort of system. That is yet to come. This is kind of the ideas that are going into it. So this is a measurement system in two parts. The first is the effort to measure whether a particular person is worthy, quote unquote, of getting their welfare payment, which is fucked up for all the reasons we have discussed. And the second part is representing the value that the government puts in different activities. The number of points given to each activity serves as an abstraction. So it's a shift away from the activity itself to some other thing, a number which comes to represent it. The abstraction is to make it easier to standardize because then you have a number for each activity so you can compare the activities more easily and you can get somebody to work out a plan for what activities that they want to do based on those points. But it also makes it harder to actually compare what is involved because, as we shall see, the points are a very bad representation of what people actually experience in doing each of these things. So here are a bunch of examples. We're going to talk about some of these in more detail than others. These also aren't a complete list. So for example, I haven't put any of the like education and training stuff in here because that is a whole other topic. But the kind of principles that we're going to deal with the numbers here can expand to those as well. I have put these in order of the points value. So for those who are audio only, there are th like uh, four columns here. Some of them are filled out. We have the name of the activity, the points you get for doing the activity. Uh, those have values in them. I haven't filled out anything in the columns for the time that it takes to do an activity or the points per hour because we'll get to those in a bit. Uh, there are some considerations, like some activities have a restriction on how many you can do m per month or per year. We'll get to that where it's relevant here, and those come into effect more with other stuff. On its face, ordering by the points indicates that the highest value is placed on this one up the top, which is relocating for a job, which gets 100 points. More on starting a job than attending for a job interview. So starting a job gets you 50 points, attending a job interview gets you 25. Wait, so you can start a job and still not meet your... Oh yeah, we'll get to that, don't <laughs> worry. Down here we also have work for the doll. So this is split into two bits. So if you work more than 15 hours a week and work for the doll, you get 20 points, independent on how many more than 15 hours you work. Uh, if you work 15 hours or fewer, you get 15 points per week. The Labour government has done a bunch of tweaks to the activities, mostly, so these are, as far as I know, the most up-to-date ones. These are based on the PDF downloaded from the Workforce Australia site at time of recording. Prior to that, uh, like attending a job interview got you 20 points, starting a job got you 25. They've done some piddling around the edges. They've also slightly changed things like the structure of this work for the doll payment. Oh, sorry, points, but let's call it payment, effectively. Anyway, so what it used to be is that your 15 plus hours was quote unquote full time, which was 25 hours, while your up to 15 hours was quote unquote part time, which was 15 hours per week. This split into greater than 15 hours and up to 15 hours mirrors what they've done with other education and training stuff. So how I talk about this work for the doll structure carries on quite directly to like what was part-time full-time education is now up to 15 contact hours a week, 15 plus contact hours a week. But we're only going to do it for work for the doll in this case. The least valued activity based on the points are completing a job application and five hours of paid work. These are the ones that I've shown you, there are others that are roughly equivalent to this. But as suggestively labeled in these other columns, I think that there are other factors involved in measuring the activities, particularly for an individual trying to determine the impact on their lives. The first other consideration is how long it takes to do the activity, which I've just called time. Two activities with the same points total aren't really the same for the person doing them if one takes twice as long as the other. We can actually introduce a new way of evaluating or valuing these activities, which I have called points per hour, which is basically how many points you get per hour of doing an activity. This has become an estimation process because the time 
winds up being an estimate once you take away, like, define things like this full-time work for the doll thing being a set 20 hours. I'm going to put a shout out to Daniel Levy, who did the hard work on estimating the time for these. I just said, hey, this would be a good idea. He then got very distracted from what he was doing at the time and went and did a bunch of research on it. Thanks, Daniel. <laughs> so unless you have a specified number of hours, like this part-time work for the doll, which is no longer called part-time work for the doll, the value of time can vary. Let's take an example. Let's say I do two three-hour shifts in a cafe one week. So that is paid work. I'm doing six hours. But because paid work is in five-hour lots rounded up, I get one five-hour lot and then another five-hour lot for that extra one hour. So my six hours of work gets me ten points. This gives me, in terms of points per hour, 10 points divided by 6 hours, which is 1 and 2 thirds points, I'm going to write this as PTS, per hour. If I do 10 hours of paid work in a week, that is 10 points for 10 hours, which is 1 point per hour. So to me, it's worth if I'm looking at this points per hour thing only, it's worth me doing six rather than ten because I get more points per hour worth out of it. Of course, for paid work, I get paid for those extra four hours if I do the ten hours, but that's a different consideration that has to come into this. If I'm just looking at the points per hour metric, it's worth doing six rather than ten. Work for the doll also has this structure. The most efficient way to get work for the doll points is to do just one hour per week, because then you get into this work for the doll up to 15 hours thing, and you get 15 points for one hour of work, which gives you 15 points per hour. If you're doing work for the doll, do you have control over how many hours you would do though? Yeah, so that's the, the kind of issue with this sort of thing in that What's more likely is that you will have some number of hours that you are contracted to do, whether that's in work for the doll or your paid work. You don't control that, but you can still calculate this points per hour statistic on that basis. But I think it's important to note that you're in charge of what you report. Yes. Right? So you can report it in the number of hours that you want. You don't have to report 10 hours of paid work for 10 points at one point per hour. You can report it as two lots of six if you've done 12 hours instead, right? Uh, but this is a based on a week. So if you do 12 hours of work over two weeks, like you could do that as six and six, as opposed to like 12 hours of work in like the one week, which would be like three lots rather than four. But then of course you run into the problem of, well, what happens if your boss finds out and decides to be a spiteful asshole and report you to send a link? because it's not clear what the surveillance systems are for this and who has the power to kind of like get that surveillance in place. And you better fucking bet that bosses are very incentivized to punish people who try to game this system. Within work from the doll, in, let's be honest, you're not going to get one hour of work for, a do work for the doll because no boss is going to let you come in for an hour and then piss off when they could be getting more work out of you. So what you might well get is this part-time 15 hours of work for a week, in which case you'd have 15 points for 15 hours, which gives you one point per hour. It is 100? 70. They say here it's 70, but if okay. it's 100, right? That you could bank up to like... 50. Like, in the, yeah. Yeah. So what's your target for the next month? Do you think that's advisable that people try and run over the amount? Or... I, I think that will, well, we'll get to that when we look at a couple of examples, but I think that will, that's so dependent on your individual circumstance. Because if you land something that's really good in one month, where like you go, oh, I, I, I've started a job, I've got a job interview, that's pushed me over, then like you could like bank that, you could do it intentionally in the sense that you go, hey, this week I have an opportunity to observe, to get more points than I, or this month, sorry, I had an opportunity to get more points than I need. I can choose to do that, or I can choose to say, well, I'm just not going to do as much time this month. It's so hard to say because the actual decision will really come down to a person's individual circumstance. But my hope is that the tool I'm building with Daniel Levy can help people to make an informed decision about that. So we'll get to a couple of examples where that kind of decision could be made. 
For now, I want to compare this kind of 15 hours at one point per hour to the full-time work for the doll. So full-time work for the doll, I don't know what it is now, but it was 25 hours. So that was 20 points for 25 hours of work, which is 0.8 points per hour. In this context, it was actually worth less points per hour to do full-time work for the doll compared to part-time work for the doll, which is slightly fucked because theoretically it's the same work. It's just that one is valued less by the government under this system than the other. This, uh, within the context of this like 15 plus hours and up to 15 hours sort of structure, if you have choice, the uh, up to 15 hours, you optimize by doing one hour, which gets you the like best return. But anything up to the 15 hours is still pretty good because it will still get you more than uh, one point per hour. If you do more than 15 per hour, the reward kind of drops off pretty quick. So if I scrub that out for a second and we look at a couple of comparisons, if we do 16 hours, that becomes 20 points divided by 16 hours, which is 1.25 points per hour. If you do uh, 20 hours, so that's 20 points per 20, 20 points for 20 hours, you get one point per hour. And we can see here that if we do the 25, whoops, sorry, my writing's getting tiny here because I'm running out of space. If we do the quote unquote full time 25 hours, it gets us 20 points, that is 0 0.8 points per hour. So we can see here that within this 15 plus hours, you actually have a really quite sh sharp drop off of the points reward for the hours worked. So if you are doing work for the doll, it's really kind of beneficial to you to minimize the number of hours that you actually do in order to maximize the points per hour that you get. As Brat brought up though, you don't necessarily get to control how many hours of these activities you do. Even outside of this work for the doll stuff where you may not choose a like, number of hours per week or for paid work, you don't necessarily get to choose if you get a job interview. So this attending a job interview thing, for 25 points, you may or may not get that. That's not under your control. Likewise, starting a job, not under your control. Even completing a job application, which is kind of the standard activity that you would do before Workforce Australia and it's kind of still a backbone of this system, that requires those job applications to be available. So that requires employers to have positions open to you that you are suitable to fill. Because if you are not suitable to fill them and you fill out those job applications anyway, the employees can go back to Centrelink and say, hey, this person is cheating on their welfare and get you punished for it. <laughs> this whole system of points assumes agency of the people doing it, which does not exist. Asking people to like plan out their points acquirement is really an imposition on them that the government cannot justify on the basis of what people can actually choose to do. What you find instead is people basically scrabble to get what they can in order to meet those points requirements, and then if slash when they fail to do so for circumstantial reasons, they get punished. Just looking at this, um, you know, the points, and yeah. calculating them here on the screen, you know, and, and watching you work out the maths, I have just calculate and. For me, this is terrifying. Like, I feel on the verge of, like, a panic attack. Oh, my God. I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, it's fine. Um, but it's just, it's a terrible thing to put on people. Yeah. Just to get a measly little payment. Like, that's outrageous. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the, like, one of the things that this system assumes is that you are comfortable enough working with numbers that you can deal with it. The people that I've sp spoken to who deal with this system, they're really... As, as far as I know, there is no provided planning situation. So there's no tool on the work for the uh, on the Workforce Australia website which allows you to plan your activities ahead. You just kind of have to fill out what you've done, and maybe it'll get be enough, or maybe you get to week three of the month, you go, "Fuck, I have to get another forty points. What am I going to do?" This is tying your ability to, to have food in the fridge to the ability to run around all day for bloody Centrelink. Like yeah, and your ability to handle this quantitative system, which, like, I'm okay with numbers, right? It's kind of my thing. But I still had to sit there and think really, really hard about, well, what's a useful thing to measure here? Because the points itself... Not very useful metric, precisely because it doesn't take into account the time. It doesn't take into account the fact that 
well, I mean, even my points per hour metric doesn't take into account the fact that if you have a really abusive work for, for the doll employer, that may be just not worth your time in a sense that it destroys you mentally, physically, whatever else, even if it's one of the only ways that you can get points. Right. And some of these points have real costs associated. Like, for instance, driver's license attainment. Yes. That's a huge undertaking, right? Like, I think you need hundreds of hours of training to get a job, li- uh, to, sorry, to get a license here in Victoria. You need to pay for the driver's license. You need to go in to to order it like all of that sort of stuff you have to take a test yeah each time you have to pay for it um and all that it gives you is 25 measly points like- yeah so there is also a points per hour of the driver training stuff but if you're paying somebody to train you to drive because you don't have friends or family members who can do it which not everybody does or maybe they are single parents who try to work themselves right that costs a shitload of money that could be like 40 dollars an hour you're not going to be able to afford that And if you are trying to do that to get points, the amount you get as as like a welfare payment is not worth the points that you get from doing that driver training. So there's this whole other layer of consideration, which is if it costs you money to do one of these activities, you kind of have to think, are the points worth it? If I get 100 points per month and I get paid like what if, uh, let's see, so $250 a week is is my baseline estimate for this. So that's $1,000 $1,000 a month. So like each point of your 100 points target is basically $10 worth if you look at it from that perspective. So if you are paying, quote unquote, more than $10 to get a point, it's costing you money. So that that applies to all of this, really. Is attending a job interview, like a job interview is like treated equally? So if you do one of those like bullshit group yep. um, job interviews that like call, center, call centers and stuff use... That is counted the same as getting like a serious yes. like um, job interview. This is one of the difficulties of this because not only are they all treated equally, even if you want to say, okay, I'm going to try and optimize this, I'm going to use something like a points per hour estimate, the, the 25 points doesn't care how long it takes you to do. And if you are trying to estimate the time, it's really hard to estimate how long it takes to attend a job interview. So in Daniel's research, he looked at an estimate of about 2.5 hours, right, to do the job interview. That includes travel time, that includes the time of the interview itself. And that varies hugely. Like, I know of, and this is a slightly different circumstance because these are people, like, high up in tech in the United States, but they will have, like, multiple day-long job applications process where they basically fly out these people to their location, you go through three days of really grueling bullshit Sometimes, like, you don't sleep during them or whatever else. That could be 48 hours it takes you to attend a job interview, you know? Like, I mean, if you have to travel a long way to get to the job interview, that blows up as well. So even this points per hour metric is not very good because you have to estimate the time. If you, and this is why, like, in the tool I'm trying to build, people are going to be able to put in their own time estimates because that gives a much better representation of what they experience. That also extends to things like work for the doll. Because if you are doing these shifts and work for the doll, let's say I have a five hour shift, I then have to travel back and forth. So my 25 hours of full-time work for the doll per week could become 35 hours if it's an hour each way. So if we include travel time, let's say for our full-time work for the doll. So you have 25 hours per week travel time. Let's say it's an hour each way. That's another 10 hours. That gives us 35 hours to get 20 points, right? So that would become 20 divided by 35, which is 0.7 points per hour. If you include travel time, which is a perfectly reasonable thing to do, and I think more employers should do that actually, or be forced to, then all of a sudden, work for the doll becomes much less valuable, quote unquote, than it was previously. And this is something that I think people should do if they're doing these calculations themselves, or if they're using the tool that I am building, is personalize it to reflect the complete circumstance, well, as much as possible, of the actual time commitment involved here. Let's talk about the ones I haven't mentioned yet. So completing a job application is worth five points. So this is, as mentioned, quite independent of how long a job application takes. And I think this particular number is inherited from the old system pre-Workforce Australia. So there, your typical mutual obligation was to do something like 20 job applications per month, right? So if your standard points target is 100 points and you do 20 applications, 
That's 20 times 5, which fills out the points requirement. Of course, this works on the assumption that there are 20 job applications for you to fill out every month, which comes back to the problem of geographical and social inequality being baked into the system, but also issues when if employers aren't looking for the kind of jobs that you can do, you get really stuck with this. And in particular, if job applications are a relatively quick thing for you to fill out, then that really punishes you because you don't have this relatively straightforward thing to get points. Job fairs are also an interesting one. For one thing, availability of job fairs and travel to job fairs. But these are also restricted. You can only do one per year. What even is a job fair? Um, so I went to one because I was required to as part of like a maths thing. And basically it's where a whole lot of uh, employers come along and say, hey, you're, you look like the kind of person who has the skills that we want. These are the sorts of jobs we have that would suit your skills. I imagine that they are, can be a little bit different if it's not like that specified. So this was specifically targeting like math students and math grads. Whereas other places, it might just be a place where a whole bunch of employers rock up and say, these are the jobs that we have available. This is the training that you'll get and that sort of thing. Whether or not they are available for somebody to do is a really big question that's part of that. Daniel estimated the time to attend a job fair to be about eight hours. So this is travel time, this is wandering around and talking to whatever as well. So that gives you 20 points, whoopsie, not 28, 20 points over 8 hours is 2.5 points per hour. Which compared to something like work for the doll is pretty good, realistically, or even compared to paid work is pretty good. This one per year restriction is basically in place so that people can't go to these job fairs and get easy points and then just go like, well, I guess I didn't do any of those jobs, huh? Or at least that's what Centrelink sees it as being. It's, it's incredibly warped. Like, you yeah. can tell somebody sitting in Canberra who's never actually been to any of these things yep. thinks this is how it works. Like, easy job fair. Like, the things are fucking boring. Yeah. You have to pay for public transport. They're hard to find. Like, you're not going to, there's not like 20 of them a year in Melbourne. Yeah. Like, and that's if you can even get there. Like, if you're in a remote area, you're stuffed. There's also a very interesting bias towards like numbers that end in a five or a zero. That's somebody basically assigning these arbitrarily based on vibe. Has decided that five and zero, yeah, they're round round numbers, right? That looks okay, whatever. Starting a job gets you a whole 50 points. But as Bart said, like that's not enough to fill out a 100 points requirement. And let's say that you do that at the start of a month. Your paycheck is monthly, so you don't necessarily get paid in that first month. And you don't get a lot of work. So if you have, say, start the job plus 10 hours per week for four weeks, that will get you a whole 80 points, which is not enough to get your next payment. So you could have started a job, you could be doing, theoretically, everything that this system is aimed at getting you to do, and it will still punish you for that, because you haven't jumped through enough of its arbitrarily chosen points. Sorry, that's 90, not 80. <laughs> My maths paranoia is working, but not fast enough. <laughs> Let's talk about the one right at the top here. This is the highest value activity. Like there is no other activity gives you 100 points and this is relocating for a job. This looks great on paper. One thing worth everything you could do for the month. Except it takes a shitload of work to actually relocate for a job. So Daniel's estimate, which was based on like two sources that talked about it, was that this would take approximately 300 hours, which varies hugely, of course. But if you take that, then the points per hour is 100 divided by 300, which is a third of a point per hour, right? That is the lowest number that we've seen so far. And this is assuming that it's only 300 hours. If you have to travel a very long way to relocate, if housing is hard to find, if it takes you weeks to actually do this, then your like 300 hours is probably not really a great estimate. Also, this kind of assumes that the relocation is contained in a single month. I don't think I have ever moved house where it has taken less than a month to do. So that means that that time commitment bleeds over into other months and takes time away from like the other months where you also have to fill that 100 points, whatever. This 100 points requirement for relocation for a job looks great, but is actually one of the most bullshit numbers in this whole charade. Is relocation for a job like moving somewhere where the job market is stronger or do you have to move with the knowledge that you have a job lined up? 
I have no fucking idea because nothing I found described what it actually required. <laughs> and this is a real issue, right? This doesn't even take into consideration the fact that Centrelink does not offer you material support to do this. So you have to do this on your own money that you have somehow built up as savings while on poverty level Centrelink support. The issue is that we don't know. Yeah. Like they have told us, like yep. things aren't clear. And we're all like shooting ideas around and then we're like, oh shit, is that fraud? I don't know. Is that yeah. fraud? We're just we're just applying for a job. What yeah. does that mean? Yes. And and like the fact that there is this uh like all of this bullshit around leaving a suitable job or not taking the suitable job applica uh, application or interview seriously, that is so subjective and so prone to abuse. And it's so hard to fight back if those are applied to you wrongly. Those fruit picking jobs are also seasonal, which yep. would be a problem if you. <laughs> yep, and and had the, the ability. Other nine yeah, and the ability to go to one requires you to have like a way of traveling and to be able bodied enough to get there, or not have like caring requirements or whatever that would keep you in one place. I mean, in general, this relocation for job thing is really fucked. One thing that I haven't put on this is like the education sort of thing. So there's a whole bunch of like education and training activities that are listed down. Some for like self-employment, some targeted at become an entrepreneur because of course that's what we should all aspire to be. I haven't put them down for one thing because many of them have a similar structure to the work for the doll. So you have up to 15 contact hours, 15 plus contact hours. But also I can say that as a teacher and as a perpetual student myself, these are based on contact hours. So that means face to face. There is a shitload more that goes into education than just the face-to-face -face hours. So, like, I know it's slightly different depending on course, but if I had a subject that had, like, a two-hour lecture and a one-hour tutorial, that's three hours face-to-face, -face, but I would be doing, like, five, ten, fifteen additional hours of work on my own for that subject to actually get through it. That's just not included in any of this, precisely because it's hard to measure. The entrepreneurial stuff is hilarious because imagine going to a bank to get like capital to open a business. Yeah, right. While on unemployment benefits. No entrepreneur has ever really started a job who didn't have some basis of capital in order to do so. And one of the things about unemployment is that you're not allowed to have huge amounts of savings. So you're fucked. You just don't have access to the resources required. And now Centrelink will claim that they give you training and loan support and all that stuff, but that's actually bullshit. I'm well, I was thinking about that with the seasonal work because I used to, um, when I was at uni, go home over the summer and mm. um, work for Grain Corp, which uh, paid quite a lot of money. And because I was living at home, I would not be paying rent. Yeah. That meant that you came out of summer with a lot of savings. That meant that would probably disqualify you from Centrelink. Yes. Getting Centrelink. <laughs> Yep, I mean, Centrelink is the, the eligibility of students to get of like young people to get student to get Centrelink has already been really stamped down because they thought that too many eighteen year olds were being paid to study. Oh god, it's so frustrating. Youth allowance is its own mess of shit as well. If you are someone subjected to the points based system, you can use your points target and this points per hour metric to minimize the time that you have to do this bullshit. Basically. You can, theoretically anyway, plan a month of activities to get to the points requirement in the minimum amount of time. Let's say that we were working with the standard 100 points. After things like paid work or work for the doll, which I don't think a lot of people have control over, what you want to do is fill up the highest points per hour activities because those will give you the greatest value of time. Of course, as mentioned, not all of these are in your control, for example, you may or may not get a job interview or there may or may not be jobs for you to apply to. So some of this requires that you are able to be flexible throughout the course of a month, which, as mentioned, is fucked and not everybody can do that. But let's work through an example. So let's say I am doing this, I have to get to my 100 points in a month. I have been put in a part-time work for the doll scheme, which is 15 hours per week, and I get uh, 15 points per lot of those 15 hours. But I'm doing it for four weeks, so that gives me 60 points. This 15 hours per week doesn't include the travel time, so in order to really work out what's going on here, let's say I have to travel half an hour there, half an hour back. So that's going to add 12 hours for a total of 72 hours for that 60 points. This is over the whole month. I now have to get 40 points, so if I go 100, 
minus 60. So I have to get 40 points on top of this work for the doll part-time stuff. For my qualification level, I can churn through job applications pretty fast because they're mostly the same information, but there's only four of them that are available for me to do this month because I've applied to all the other ones in other months. So let's say they take an hour each and I do four of them. So that gives me 20 points for four hours. I can't do more of them because there just aren't more available. Because as mentioned, if I, I can't apply for the same job twice or Centrelink will shit itself and my employer will like get me cut off from my payments. So this means I have to do 40 minus 20, which is another 20 points. Lucky me, it's been a year since the last job fair, so I can go to one again. This month, it's gonna take me about eight hours and that'll get me another 20 points. For my 100 points, I have done 72 plus 4 plus 8, which is 84 hours. For my own, like, gratification, 84 hours for, uh, let's say, about $1,000 in the month. Well, that's going to be... Ooh, I'm not going to do this in my head. Give me a second. 1,000 divided by 84 hours. So this is approximately $11.90 per hour. So you can see how my time is valued and I'll jump through all these hoops, right? This is one hypothetical situation which assumes that work for the doll is available to me, job applications, not a hell of a lot, but some are available to me, and there's a job fair going on. Let's say instead of this, I actually get a job interview from one of those applications. So now I have a job application as well. Sorry, a job interview. It takes me 2.5 hours and gets me 25 points. So now I need 40 minus 25, which is 15 points left over to get through the rest of the month. I could go to the job fair. So that would give me the full 20 points, which would get me to 105 points. I could then bank those five points for the next month. So there, this is where that kind of banking thing comes into play. If you are in a situation where you can do something that is a like high points per hour value, and bank the extra points, that could be worth you doing this month, particularly if it's not going to be available in the future. So like job interviews, I think really fall into this category because they are so random. If you get a job interview, it's worth you going to and putting in, not only because you get punished for not going to the job interview, but also because you could bank those points for the next month. And it's a really high like points per hour return. Something like a job fair will depend on whether or not you're going to get it if, if they are regularly available. So in this situation, if I go to the job fair because it's a once a year thing, I will get that 20 points. And if it's once a year, then it's not going to be available to me next month. So this gives me 20 points, which is uh, 105 total. And I would bank five of those for the next month. But it may be worth instead, if it's a job fair that runs every month, to do job applications instead. So if, let's say the job fair runs every month, so I'm not going to do it this month, but I am going to do it next month, and I don't want to spend the whole eight hours on it, I could say instead, I'm going to do job applications. So four job applications were available to me. I only need to do three to get that extra 15 points. They take an hour each, and that gives me the 15 points total. So in this case, I get my 100 points, and the hours total are, so it's 72 plus 2.5 plus 3, which I'm going to try and do in my head. So that's uh, 77, whoops, 77.5 hours for, again, about a thousand bucks. So that is 1,000 to work out the, like, money I'm getting per hour of effort. 77.5, which gives me approximately... $12.90 per hour. <laughs> it's a fucking joke, right? All of this is so fucked in the amount that it actually pays people for the activity that they have to do. Which is also why I think that this points per hour metric is really useful, because you can calculate how fucked you are. And get angry about it. Yeah, and get angry about it, as you said. Yeah, absolutely. But this way of estimating, like, the actual dollar value of your stuff per hour is something that I think could be explored a little more fruitfully. I, I don't think that people in the general public understand just how, like, 
little we value the actual time of unemployed people, mostly because many of them think that unemployed people are just like lifelong doll bludgers or whatever else. But this number, to put an actual number of the money that you get per hour of effort of jumping through this bullshit for, for the welfare system, I think that could have a very real impact on what people see as the like commitment involved here. All of this is, of course, hugely contingent on being able to do these activities in the first place and estimate the time that it takes. If you're doing this on your own, what I would say about it is that if you have to estimate the time, so let's say you do four like four job applications, and because you're a huge nerd like me, you decide to time yourself doing them, how you work out the like average time per hour is you get the total time divided by the number of applications. And that becomes your estimate of the like applications of the like applications per hour. So let's say I do my four applications, that takes me five hours. So I do 5 divided by 4, which is, oh god help me, I think it's 1.25? Uh, it's decimals, I don't know how to do decimals. Okay, so that's 1.25 <laughs> uh, applications per hour. Sorry, um, no, that's app. I need to get my units straight. Sorry, this is not applications per hour, this is hours per application. Because how I think about that is it's hours per application, right? So that's going to be per application, which is not the same as applications per hour. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, so this is going to be the units that I use for that time estimate. I can then say, okay, if each uh, application takes me 1.25 hours and I get five points per hour, this is going to become my estimate of the points per hour for that particular task. So if you have to do this on your own, you have to provide your own estimates of the time, this is the structure you would use to do so. Of course, if you really struggle with this stuff, that's not going to help. And one of the things I want to build into this tool that I'm working on is like making these questions simpler for people. So I could ask them, how many job applications have you done and how long did it take you to do them in total or something like that and then do this stuff behind the scenes so it's not as like hard for people to get their head around. My hope is that the tool I'm working with can help but it still requires people to for one know about it and for two be able to use it. The people least able to use it due to limited internet active connectivity for example or no access to a computer or a phone to do it, language difficulties or a disability which makes using the tool difficult, are the most likely to be shat on by this stupid system overall. Because it is precisely those barriers which make this whole like numerical confluence hard to understand and hard to deal with because you don't have access to the resources to do it. That is something that none of this can really address. And it's also why like this points-based system, well, one of the reasons why this points-based system really needs to be abolished, because it specifically punishes the people who are least able to hit, to deal with it. The system is incredibly overwhelming. It's asking people to fly by the seat of their pants and... It's already anxiety-inducing enough, and that only makes it worse. Yeah, no, it's going to be very difficult for many, many people. So I know a number of people who are having to deal with this, and like on top of this being a confusing like statistical structure that they have never had to deal with or don't really understand, they also keep having it change in front of them. Like I've had people who live in the Hunter Valley who got like flooded out, for example, who have had their points requirement change with no explanation to them. And they can't see what's led to that decision. It's just this arcane thing that looms over them and punishes them and impoverishes them at every turn for no discernible reason. And I'm very glad, Asha, that people like you are writing about this and kind of fighting it as well. I think talking about it helps. Yeah, for sure. When we looked at RoboDebt, people thought that it was just them going through the system and mm. that they'd obviously made a mistake, that it was their fault. But the reality is these systems are set up to make you fail and that it's not your fault if you're facing these systems. Join up with um, the Australian Unemployed Workers Union. Um, seek out other people who are going through the same experiences um, because you'll probably find that it's not just you who's getting screwed over by these systems. Yeah, and the um, AWU is a really, really powerful tool. I'm just going to spruik them for a second. So they are a union 
uh, not in the like ACTU, oh, you have to you have to satisfy these definitions, blah, 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 but in the sense that it is an organized group of people in a particular environment. So this is unemployed workers who are advocating for themselves and organizing for themselves to improve their material conditions. They are an extremely good group of people. Membership is free. You don't have to like pay membership dues precisely because it's in it for unemployed people, but you can if you want, or if you have like money, you can donate that. You can also donate your time, but if you need that support, they have a hotline that you can call. Uh, I can't remember the exact hours, but it's on their website where if you need support in, in, in like dealing with these systems, if you are in a situation where you're coming up against a decision you don't understand or a points total that you want to challenge or some sort of punishment that you want to challenge, the the hotline is a very, very good first stop for you because they will they have a lot of experience with the system and can give you good advice on what your options are and where to apply pressure. They are a really good bunch to go and talk to uh, if you have are subjected to all this, and they are fighting quite hard with a bunch of other groups as well to get the whole thing scrapped because it's shit and it shouldn't exist. Also, if you are employed, it's good to... I just have like a monthly donation thing coming out of the account. Like, it's yep. good to keep this, these things it, running. If you, ha if you have the money available, it's an, it's an incredibly valuable mutual aid system. And like... It's run by unemployed people for unemployed people, so that money really does go back into those support services. I think that's an episode. Asha, thank you so much for coming on. Where can people find you? Uh, on Twitter, usually. Um, Asha underscore wolf at, um, on Twitter. Cool. You are always welcome to come and DM me on Twitter. Um, occasionally I'm published in the Canberra Times, um, but just not at the moment while I'm working. Yeah, for sure. It's a lot of work. So, other than that, I wish to advertise that we have a Patreon. Patreon.com slash statistically insignificant. Buy us coffee and beer. I run on coffee and wine. Bart runs on beer. And also coffee. Yeah, okay, fair enough. I guess, yeah. You can't, you can't exactly ride your bike drunk to do work, I guess. <laughs> and uh, thank you, Bart, again, for coming on. Thank you very much. Oh, um, and just because we've got a guest on, uh, I might plug my Twitter, which is at Snitch and Orwell. Come see some communist jokes and some <laughs> movie opinions. All right. I will talk to you later. Speak to you, man.